Hey guys, Derek Wilson here to reconstruct the prehistoric past with you and journey deep into history's marvels and mysteries with you. So in this episode, we are going to travel around the world together to several different locations. We're going to start in Mexico at Chichen Itza uh, to explore a little known Mayan temple that I visited several years ago. Uh, where something very interesting was found inside. Uh, next, we're going to go to Indonesia uh, to check out some very strange humanoid looking statues that feature some very crazy uh, body parts. I'll just leave it there. Uh, from there, we're going to go to a cave in the great state of Virginia where something, or should I say someone, very or quite creepy was found inside. And uh, lastly, we would go back to Mexico to the infamous site of Teotihuacan, uh, where we will consider some of the architectural anomalies that may disrupt the mainstream narrative regarding this site's ancient origins. You are not going to want to miss uh, this episode. But before we jump into all of these topics, I want to let you know that registration is live for our Megalithic Marvels of Peru tour coming this October 2nd through the 12th. This is going to be the trip of a lifetime. It's going to be an 11-day journey that's going to take us to famous sites like Machu Picchu and all kinds of hidden gem sites you've probably never heard of. Uh, we're going to study the incredible Inca Empire while simultaneously looking for evidences of lost ancient technology uh, that might predate the Inca. Uh, we already have uh, 20 uh, registrations or so, I believe. So this uh, tour is filling up fast. I think we're only going to take about 30. Uh, so you can go to megalithicmarvels.com slash tours to get all the info or just click the link below in the show notes to uh, re be redirected to all the information about this amazing tour. And I really hope to see you this October in Peru. If you happen to be on Instagram, give me a follow at Megalithic Marvels. I just posted a video uh, recently of a crazy mummy that's on display in Peru in north of Lima, I believe. So it's not the Cusco area, um, but this is a mummy fully intact, its entire body in this case, in this museum. And it features a very large elongated skull. Uh, this is not something you see every day, especially not in the U.S., you have to go to places like Peru to see this stuff. That's where we're going. When I look at this mummy, the skull uh, seems to be a natural elongated skull, meaning it wasn't just cradle headboarded because the cranial volume or mass of this mummy looks like it might be 15 to 20 percent larger uh, than a conventional human skull like ours. Uh, again, making me believe this is probably genetic. So very fascinating to see. Uh, you can find that video on my Instagram account. Um, it's probably also on Twitter by now, uh, my Facebook page, and YouTube uh, shorts. You can find it there. Well, I am super excited that uh, our Egypt tour is almost here. I fly out May 15th, and uh, I think about 30 people are going to join us for our Megalithic Marvels of Egypt tour. Uh, starting in Giza with uh, our tour guide, Mohammed Ibrahim, who's also an Egyptologist. And uh, it's just going to be the trip of a lifetime. I cannot wait. i uh, going to be looking for evidences of lost ancient technology. I'll probably also be posting uh, a lot of up-to-date content on Instagram and such. So again, another reason to follow if you kind of want to keep up with our trip. But you never know. Sometimes internet in Egypt can be really uh, spotty. Last year we went in February where it was pretty cold at times and, and windy. But now that we're going in May, it looks like the temperatures are going to be a lot hotter. It's going to be in the 90s. So I've got my spray bottles ready and cannot wait to get back from that trip and share with you uh, all the latest research and findings. So look forward to that as well. All right, let's journey together first to Mexico to a site that I was at back in 2020 uh, known as Chichen Itza, or as some call it, Chicken Pizza. And the structure I want to talk about is known as the ossuary. Uh, it's also known as, get this, the High Priest's Tomb. 
and it's part of what is known as the Centra Group at Chichen Itza. And it's really the first large structure you will see when coming from the Kukukan Pyramid, which is the uh, main attraction there at Chichen Itza, the main pyramid. Traditionally thought to have been founded around 500 AD, uh, there's been some recent discoveries that suggest Chichen Itza may be at least 400 years older uh, than once believed. Uh, Dr. Guillermo uh, Dianda, an underwater archaeologist and head of the Great Maya Aquifer Project, has recently stated that this ancient city was actually founded around 100 AD based on studying the carbon remains of material artifacts found in nearby underwater caves. Now, if you're watching the video version of this episode on Spotify or YouTube, you're going to see exactly what I'm describing. But if you're only listening to this, um, I'm going to link below an article or video regarding exactly what I'm stating so that you um, can see what I'm talking about just in case you want to. So just click the link in the show notes below if you're just listening to this. Now, like the Kuku Khan Pyramid, the Ossuary is a step pyramid as you can see, but on a much smaller scale. It stands about uh, 10 meters tall and features four sides made up of seven main layers that each include a staircase. At the center top of this structure is an entrance which descends vertically down into the base of the pyramid. Now, it's really unfortunate when you go to a site like Chichen Itza, at least when I was there in 2020, a structure like I'm describing, the small step pyramid, it's all roped off. So you can't even get close enough to touch it, you know, without breaking the park rules there. Unlike in Egypt, where you can walk up to the megalithic pyramids and not just touch them, but go inside of them. So I understand they want to protect um, the step pyramid, but it is really unfortunate that you can't get closer because you can see that all these stairs on each side are clearly all pointing to the top, which again, like I just said, at the center top is this entrance which descends vertically down into the base of the pyramid. Now, I guess once you get down to the base of the pyramid, this leads to a natural cave about 40 feet below where several tombs and uh, skeletons were unearthed, uh, surrounded by crystals, rock crystals, jade, and copper artifacts. Uh, this is apparently why Edward H. Thompson, who excavated the cave in the late 19th century, dubbed this structure as the High Priest's Temple. And it is rumored that there is a tunnel system connected to this cave that measures more than 20 kilometers in length uh, that may lead to other Mayan cities in the vicinity. Uh, around the structure can also be seen a stone mosaic mask of Chalk, the god of rain, and the feathered serpent deity, Kuku Khan, is seen featured here at the base of the staircase of this ossuary with his mouth open. And it is often connected to the subterranean underworld. So this is such a fascinating Mayan site to me. Uh, Chichen Itza, again, amazing site. The Kukukan Pyramid gets all the love and uh, photographic attention uh, when you're Googling this site. But there's so many other uh, sites surrounding that pyramid, like this ossuary, or as it's known, the High Priest's tomb or temple, my mind can't help but wonder what it must have been like to be this uh, archaeologist, Edward Thompson, in the late 19th century, who got to descend vertically down this shaft to the base of the pyramid and journey into this natural cave 40 feet below and find tombs and skeletons and crystals, jade, and copper artifacts. That must have been an incredible experience. And being that he dubbed it the, the High Priest Temple, I want to do a deeper dive on this structure at some point and find out 
if there's any uh, description of these skulls, if they were possibly elongated or um, anything in that nature, anything that would uh, maybe give more information on why he dubbed the structure as the High Priest's Temple. All right, let's journey now to Indonesia. So hidden away in uh, what's known as the Bada Valley, I believe, south of the Lor Lindu National Park, again in Indonesia, are hundreds of ancient, megalithic, and prehistoric statues estimated to be at least 5,000 years old. Obviously, they might be much older than that, but uh, they're estimated to be at least 5,000 years old. Um, now, it's not known for certain when these megaliths were made, uh, nor who made them, uh, but they were discovered uh, apparently by Western archaeologists in 1908. Now, in the great scale of uh, history, 1908 does not seem like it was that far off uh, to me. Now, if you're seeing, again, the video uh, versions of this episode, you're seeing exactly what I'm talking about. If you're only listening uh, via Apple Podcasts or somewhere else, click the link in the show notes to see exactly what I'm talking about. But you are going to see these enormous cylinders known as kalambas, and they range in height from 5 feet all the way up to 10 feet uh, high, and they were crafted from individual blocks of solid stone. Again, some would call these cylinders, others would call these containers, but uh, I mean, these appear to be made out of granite or something like granite. These are massive stone containers. What's most impressive to me about these kalambas or these giant container containers are the lids uh, laying next to some of these things. They feature, you know, precision like elements on one of the lids are really intricate designs of uh, what looks like uh, creatures. But if these containers weren't uh, amazing enough, we've got these humanoid looking statues that range in height from two feet to more than 15 feet high and depict these anthropomorphic and zoomorphic figures. Now, none of the statues you can see have legs, but most of them have large uh, heads and disp display really interesting facial features and genitalia. The largest of these statues is known as uh, Palindo, I believe it's pronounced, which translates as the entertainer. And this is the largest uh, standing stone of these statues. It measures over 15 feet high. Um, check out these photographs with people standing next to it. It's fascinating. And um, yeah, you can say he's got some pretty big genitalia there. Uh, most of the statues have fallen over. And uh, I mean, they're scattered all over. Some of them are half buried in streams, as you can see in the middle of fields. Uh, they really seem to be all over the place. Now, I found it very interesting that the oral tradition among the village elders around this area states that these figurines are a representation of the population that preceded them. Okay, that's very interesting. We've got these humanoid-looking statues, some that are 15 feet tall, have these strange anthropomorphic features and very large genitalia. And again, measuring 15 feet high, is this alluding to uh, some kind of ancient race of hybrids, uh, demigods, Nephilim, as uh, Genesis 6-4 hints at and the Book of Enoch talks about. So like the statues, back to the giant containers, Obviously, they remain a profound mystery uh, that archaeologists haven't been able to solve. Many have propagated that these massive stone containers were simply ancient bathtubs. Uh, but again, there's giant lids found nearby that clearly fit these uh, containers. So you've got 15 foot tall um, ancient statues that look like humanoids 
that uh, oral tradition says uh, represented the population that preceded them. And then you've got these ancient, massive uh, stone containers that look like they were made for giants. Man, I've got so many questions when it comes to the site. Uh, namely, what were these giant containers used for? Um, also, were the containers, do the containers predate the statues? Were the containers left from long ago and used by a possible giant hybrid race? Did a later civilization come along and erect the statues in remembrance of these giant deified ancestors? Or did this supposed previous giant civilization uh, make the statues in remembrance of themselves or as grave markers? Man, all kinds of questions, and I hope someday to get to the site and see them for myself. All right, now let's travel back to the good old U.S. of A, to the great state of Virginia, where I teased at the beginning, where something, or should I say someone, was found in a cave. And this is coming from an actual New York Times article that I discovered from 1871. Okay, that's going back a ways. An 1871 New York Times report. And I'm going to link this exact article in the show notes below so that you can read it with your own eyes. And you can see that this is a bona fide New York Times article. Forgive me if this gets a little bit choppy because this is an old newspaper article and the English is a little bit different than our modern day, but I'm going to do the best I can. This article was titled way back in 1871, quote, more big Indians found in Virginia, end quote. And this was published on September 8th, 1871. It reads, quote, not to be behind Canada, Virginia puts in a claim of the possession of a cave full of dead Indians. The Petersburg Index giving the tale as quoted below, on the authority of gentlemen whom it asserts to be of the highest character and credit, who have seen with their own eyes and touched and tested with their own hands the wonderful objects of which they make report as follows. The workmen engaged in opening a way for the projected railroad between Weldon and Garysburg struck Monday about one mile from the former place in a bank beside the river, a catacomb of skeletons, supposed to be those of Indians of a remote age and a lost and forgotten race. The bodies exhumed were of strange and remarkable formation. The skulls were nearly an inch in thickness. The teeth were filed sharp, as are those of cannibals, the enamel perfectly preserved. The bones were of a wonderful length and strength, the femur being as long as the leg of an ordinary man the stature of the body being probably as great as eight or nine feet. Near the heads were sharp stone arrows, stone mortars, in which their corn was brayed. The teeth of the skeletons are said to be as large as those of horses. One of them has been brought to the city and presented to an officer of the Petersburg Railroad. The bodies were found closely packed together. There was no discernible ingress into or egress out of the mound. Okay, so at the beginning of this episode, I teased that this was found in a cave. Um, but as I'm reading the article again, it says mound. So these were found in likely an ancient mound in Virginia. These are apparently eight to nine feet tall. It says they've got teeth as thick as horses' teeth, uh, the femur. Uh, on at least one of these was as long as the leg of an ordinary man, uh, and they had filed teeth. That is so interesting, and, and it said thick skulls. So fascinating to me. Uh, I'm somebody who collects these articles uh, from the late 1800s, early 1900s. 
of this supposed race of um, some would call giants. They're usually anywhere from seven to eight or even nine feet tall. And again, they're often found in mounds. I would encourage you to go back and listen to the episode I did uh, just a few weeks ago with Dr. Gregory Little on the ancient mounds of America and what he calls the elite ruling class who ruled the Americas thousands of years ago. We're talking maybe 8,000 years ago and further. Um, he he believed that there was a primitive you know, peoples that lived in uh, America back then during this mound building culture. But the this elite ruling class of seven to nine foot tall um, hybrids basically ruled the masses and set up um, these mounds that are uh, astronomical. So go back and listen to that episode to see a bunch of amazing photographs of these mounds and to really get a deep dive on the origins of the ancient mound building culture of America. All right, let's keep it in North America, but we'll travel just a little bit south back to Mexico to talk about the forgotten megaliths of Teotihuacan. And I will link to this article in the show notes. This is an article that um, researcher Marco Vagato wrote from Megalithic Marvels a couple of years back. Great research and analysis. And uh, I wanted to read it from it for you guys. He writes, Between the 2nd century and the 5th century AD, the Great Pyramid city of Teotihuacan was the largest in the Western Hemisphere, the Rome of America, with a population of nearly 250,000. Yet its monumental avenues and massive pyramids dedicated to the sun, the moon, and the feathered serpent conceal the vestiges of a much older and even more mysterious past. The foundations of great megalithic buildings are visible under some of the structures of the ancient city. The older structures employing large, finely dressed megalithic blocks, in contrast to the later structures being largely built of mud bricks and small cemented stones. There is evidence that an immense megalithic structure may have once stood in the area now occupied by the Pyramid of the Feathered Serpents. Hundreds of andesite stone blocks, many weighing in excess of 10 tons, lie scattered over a very large area and were apparently reused as part of the filling of the pyramid. These blocks exhibit sharp edges perfectly planar surfaces and complex concave surfaces that would have been nearly impossible to obtain from the primitive flint and obsidian tools supposedly available to the ancient builders of Teotihuacan. Some of the stones recovered uh, from the filling of the pyramid even show evidence of drilling and saw marks as to suggest some mechanical method for cutting stone. An immense effort must have gone into the quarrying, cutting, and fitting of these enormous stone blocks, as no local source of andesite stone exists in a range of 25 miles from Teotihuacan across very rugged mountainous terrain. Yet there seems to be no trace of structures to which the stones originally belonged. Again, I will link this article in the show notes if you're not seeing the video version of this podcast so that you can see these pictures that Marco of Gato has taken. Uh, he lives in Me Mexico. He's a very great researcher. And again, this blew my mind when Marco brought this to my attention. But this is a fascinating question to consider. Does Teotihuacan have megalithic elements that go far, far back? I mean, you look at these photographs and you clearly see on this uh, backside, I believe, of Teotihuacan, these megalithic blocks scattered. These are multi-ton blocks. Marco says some of these are 10 tons scattered. These are made of andesite. They're very, it's a very tough stone. 
Um, but these are very ancient, so they're weathered. You can still see their their shape is kept up. They're very rectangular, sharp edges, like he says. These appear to predate everything else at Teotihuacan. This leads me to the biggest obvious question. Is Teotihuacan much older than we've been led to believe? Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Make sure to subscribe and also check out my last episode where I interviewed explorer and landscape photographer Abby Warnock Matthews regarding Utah's very strange anthropomorphic petroglyphs and Skinwalker Ranch. Until next time, keep exploring.